and put down. So if there are any questions, please throw them in. If there's stuff that we don't cover that you were expecting, throw them in and we'll try and cover as much as we can as we go on through the night. Just for the first few minutes, rather than me and Graham and Andy talking, just for the first kind of 30 seconds or so, there's three points. All we want you to do, and it'll give Graham a bit of insight leading into this workshop now, can you just put in the chat function? And if you don't know where that is, if you just slide your mouse onto your screen, you'll see that there's a little tab that you can tap onto, which is for the chat bar. If you click on there, you'll then be able to input some stuff. And all we want from you for the first 30 seconds is just a little bit of information about how long you spend during the planning process in the lead up to a training session. Now, be as honest as you can with that. It might be that you spend an hour, it might be you spend 10 minutes, you might not currently plan. Just want to get a little bit of insight. So just 30 seconds, I'll pipe down. If you can just put some stuff in the chat function there about how long you spend in your planning process currently. <laughs> Are we getting stuff, Graham, Andy? Yeah. Excellent. Appreciate that, everybody. Worth noting that we've, we've been discussing today, and this is very much about you guys. We don't have all the answers um, as tutors that are on here today. We don't have the answers, but this is very much about you. So we want you, as I say, to interact and engage as much as you can. If you've completed that first one, if you just move down to the second point, and then what we want you to just pop in the chat function and this time is around why you decide to plan and then subsequently deliver any given session. So you've got a training session this coming week on Thursday night. Why do you decide to plan what you decide to plan and then deliver? OK, so just a little bit of your kind of thought process around why you decide to put on what you put on for the players. Again, that will just give Graham and ourselves a little bit of insight. OK, and if you have done that one, same again, just for the last point, what things do you currently put into your session plan? Now, what we don't really want to see at this moment, because this is more around coaching, we're not too concerned about you putting things in around risk assessments and medical details and contact information. Just really focus around the coaching aspects, around working with teams, players and people. What detail do you currently put into your session plan? Again, no right or wrong answer. Just really interested to see the kind of things that's going off within the county at the moment. And I'll just give you a minute or so just to kind of complete that last one and maybe any of your, of your previous thoughts. We've still got stuff coming in, Graham. I can't see. Yeah, we've still got. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. There's, there's quite a split around planning um, after a game, and some actually uh, planning around a coaching program that they have in place. Lovely. So it, there's a there's a a couple of hit what we do or we're going to look at, which is uh, gives us something to work with. Smash it. That's great. Guys, just worth noting at this point, um, just before we do get kicked on properly, that Andy Brown will have, if he hasn't already, he will be hitting the record button. So if there is anything that you miss, um, you'll be able to catch up with this probably at some point next week. Or if you want to share any links that we put out with any of the coaches within your clubs, feel free to do so as well. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass over to, um, to Graham in a second. As I say, Graham's going to drive and lead this. And myself and Andy will chip in as and when required, but we don't want to take over the presentation. Um, Graham has probably been tutoring for as long as I've been alive. So the amount of knowledge and experience that Graham's got is superb. So hopefully you're going to get quite a lot of stuff out of this. Just final point from me before I do hand over. Um, of the coaches that are registered tonight, of the 200 that we did have registered, 
there was around about three or four A licensed coaches, around about 35 to 40 UEFA B coaches, and then a split between level one and two. So the detail that Graham's going to deliver um, will be quite generic to an extent, but you'll be able to take from it what you see is right for you, your mm. players, your teams, but I'll let Graham dive into that. Okay, over to you, Clarky. Yeah, first slide. Thanks, Rich. Um, welcome, everybody. It's good to see uh, so many of you have joined us tonight. And as Rich said, there is a, a quite a range of coaches uh, heavily weighted towards level one, but hopefully we can go generically across the piece. And this is why it's so important to ask questions. Um, if there's something you would like to ask, ask it. If we can answer, we will. If we can't, well, I'll take it away and I'll get back to you at some point. So let's get into the slide. I want you to just have a look at the slide. I'm just going to go very quickly through this, then dig a little deep before we move on. So when we're looking at planning and practice design, it's a theme that can derive from a variety of places. And looking at some of your answers on there, some of you do have a technical development program. Others have looked at a recent performance. Other areas we can look at is an immediate area of work, a modern trend or innovation, and something you have observed in a game or TV. So let's just take it back. Um, on the technical development program, for those of you who are, are unaware, lots of, certainly in the professional phases, they have um, academies which run um, technical development programs or what we call as coaching cycles or schemes of work. Whereas, and this all depends on whether you have more than one or two sessions a week where one of the sessions will be around the development program and possibly the other one may be around coach's choice. So that would link into your recent performance. Now, on a recent performance, normally after a game, you'll go away and reflect um, and then want to either develop a theme or revisit. Now, as a level one, that might be looking at what we call the fundamentals or coaching components. As a level two, it might be around skill execution. At level three, that might be around a unit role. Or at level four, it might be a, a tactical, technical um, session design. Now, the immediate area of work, it may be a, a specific problem that uh, continues to occur, and you might want to address that. Um, that could be around an individual, a unit, or a team. The case for me, though, is you need to then also think about how does that affect the rest of your group if you're looking at an individual area of development, particularly if you're working in a small side of game. The modern trend of innovation, if we just look at what's happening now, particularly when we come back into after lockdown with the Premiership, the new rule that came out this season with regards to the goal kick, we're now seeing teams playing out from the back so much more deeper. It may be something that you look at and you would like to bring into your coaching. And finally, something you observed. That might be on a on TV, it might be during a game, it might be something that you've read or during a CPD event. Um, Rich, Andy, is there anything you, you'd like to add on that particular slide? Not at the moment, Grim. No, it's not, not for me. Is anything um, from the chat, anything anybody would like to ask on that particular slide before we move it on? There's, there's no questions as yet. Okay, so if you want to just move it on. Um, <clears throat> remember the chat box, and I want you to just have a look at it. Look at the slide, and what does it mean to you? We need to find the best way to present the work that we allow for the necessary amount of repetition without boredom, striking a balance between giving the players what they want, but also what they need. So just what do you think that could mean to you as a coach in the beginning? Any questions coming in? None as yet. None as yet. Um, for me, this is thinking time, and some of you have talked about it in, in the chat with regards to the questions Rich asked. Um, thinking about your environment, thinking about your group, um, 
how often you train. Some only train once a week. Some some years will train maybe it's two, three. Um, your experience, and then what phase you may be in. Are, are you in the foundation phase, which is from well, seven to twelve or nine to twelve if you're in academies, or are you in the youth development phase from twelve to sixteen, or you're in the open age phase? So. Looking at that, you've got to think about what's the best way to present the session practice. So what will you need to consider? Anything to add, lads? I mean, just, just a quick point really linked to the stuff around repetition, Clarky, that we spoke about this before, that what we have to do as coaches with regards to our planning and then the delivery, it's about getting repetition without it becoming repetitive. So where Clarky has mentioned there about the boredom stuff, that's really important. So regardless of whether you're working on an individual basis, whether you're working in a small-sided game, whatever it is you're working on, how can you get lots and lots of repetition without the practice becoming repetitive? Okay, not particularly easy, but just something to consider. How can you get repetition without it becoming repetitive? Well, just just had a question in here from uh, Louis Pye. It's got in grassroots setting, how is the best way to differentiate between what the player wants and what the parents want? That might be something that you do at the beginning of the season with your um, coaching cycle. How, I mean, if you've got one session, you might want to discuss that. But if you've got two or the club's got a, a scheme of work in place, I'm sure that will all be explained at the beginning of the season when uh, the young player joins the club, that you have a coaching cycle to follow. And as, as I said, if you've got two sessions a week the second one you may be able to accommodate now again looking at your question is it for the individual only and if if so for the individual through some of the formats that we're going to look at uh, you may be able to accommodate that so working for an individual looking at and we're going to go through this further on in the slides if it's a technical practice you might be able to do some um an individual learning program for the, for that young player or players. Hope that answers your question. Anything to add? Any more, Andy, on questions? Uh, no, it's there's a lot of ideas coming through with with what people are suggesting, which which is good to see. Okay. So, Rich, if you want to move it on again. So, listen, the the key objectives, um, let's just look at the first paragraph. Uh, once we've decided on a theme slash topic, uh, we will highlight the key priorities and look at the structure in a logical order. So what does that mean to you when you first look at that, a logical order? Just give you a, a second to think about it. And if you want to put something in the chat box, do so. So we've got from lower scaffold and the player's knowledge. Consideration towards how the session can be amended from Steve Dix. Okay. So what I want you to think about is what we call key factors or key priorities, uh, key outcomes, objectives, um, Link the DNA, so it may be to do with the technical components, it may be to do with principles of play, it may do with in-out possession phases if you're working at level three, level four. However, um, what looks good on paper never looks the same in practice. So that middle paragraph there when we talk about um, logical order never occurs, but if you're early in your coaching pathway, Development of logical order is maybe best for you. So what we're saying is that at level one or level two and level two, you may want to try in the beginning following a sequence, um, a number of points in an order, a one, two, three, A, B, C, until you feel confident to begin to coach in the flow of the game. Now, if you're a level three, four, 
you should know a reasonable amount of experience to coach in the flow of the game and practice and identify when to interfere, intervene and coach key factors, objectives when they occur. Okay, now just going back, this could be achieved if you're going to go in a logical sequence by introducing what we call start positions. Just create a position to bring out something that you want to happen if it's in a game situation. Okay. Um, once you've got that logical order in place and you're satisfied with that, it may be a good idea to discuss with a fellow coach and what you've done. So in other words, there may be someone within your club, um, there may be someone who's a critical friend and they can have a look at that plan with you and just discuss. It just, but remember at the end of the day, it's, it's down to you, you as the coach and it's your group. So when we talk about players with trial and error, it's, it's the same with yourselves to try it. And if it doesn't work, can we tweak? Um, Rich, Andy, anything to add with that? I think just, just one point I just want to throw in right now, Clark, is just that top line one around once we've decided on a topic, it kind of links back to the previous slide as well around here, around what your players want and what they need. The big thing for me now is, we spoke about this yesterday as tutors, how many of you um, really look into what you feel your players need as a group and individually and then start to plan your session around that? Or how many of you turn up at training and you go, oh, I've got a lovely session or I've seen this before. I'm going to go and put this on and we're just going to work within it. Where actually what we should be doing as coaches is going, this is what our players need collectively and individually. This is what we're going to work on this evening. And now I'm going to plan my session around that. And linking in with actually the stuff that Clark has mentioned around um, your key factors or your technical tactical information and then how you're going to bring that to life through your range of intervention and coaching styles. But really important that you look at what your players need. If you can get that balance of what they need and what they want, great. But then what we're going to work on and then how can we start planning from there rather than just going, I've got a session. We're now going to start putting the fluff around it and then we'll put a theme on or a topic on what we're going to work on and then how we're going to build it from there. Andy? No, no, that's fine. Is there any key questions that it's kicked out yet or...? Nothing as such, no. There's a, just a few points around, obviously, scaffolding the players' knowledge, um, developing a session to suit the strongest and weakest players. Um, but I think that'll be covered a bit later on as we go. Yeah. OK, Rich, we'll, we'll move it on to the next slide, please. So, um, how I process my thoughts. I just want you to have a look at the, the slide, everybody. Uh, take a moment and just have a look at it, and we're gonna we're gonna sort of go through it bit by bit. And please put your questions into the chat box, and then we'll 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 be able to um, help you with some of your thoughts. So I'm just I'm gonna look at organisation. And what, what, it mean, what we mean by the organisation is just pick the area of the field that you may want to work, um, not in particular the area of field that you've, you've got to work. Think about the area of the field that you want to work. So if you've just got a corner of a, a 3G, well, that might be your uh, central midfield for the evening. So think about your rules, think about your constraints, and think about your challenges. If you are involved, if, if you're going to go into a, a game practice. Now, we also got to think about within that the practice flow. So the practice flow of linking it from one practice to another and ensuring that the key messages go between each, um, each practice. So in the organization, you may want to consider as well as the three R's, the restrict, relate and reward. And if, if you're unsure on that, just put it into the box and then we'll look to discuss that. Or if it's more game orientated, we might look at the four days. Okay. So just on organization, if you've got any questions on organization before we move on to another box.
Just for the purpose, Graham, of the learners, what are the four yeah. Ds? Uh, the four Ds is to do with direction, definition, decisions and difference, which is more inclined to be probably at level three and two, to be fair, with regards to playing in a game. Um, you've got to think about when you're developing um, your teams, you may be in a format where you've got from 5v5 up to 9v9. Some of might have 11v11, or however, you may not have that area of field. So you've got to consider what you're going to do with your group in that evening in that area of the field. Um, how can you ensure that they're all involved in that? But with the, the four Ds, the direction is, in essence, is one directional and looking at um, team going one way and possibly, if you could, you could work with two teams with two balls so there is no threat to the ball. However, you could be working one way into another with, with your theme, which could be a passing theme. On definition, it's a specific area, so playing through the midfield. And then you're looking at, uh, are you then dealing with your primary unit, your secondary unit, and the shape? So it, you may look at which midfield players you're looking at. Is it a four and eight? Is it a 10? Um, and, and them as your primary players, but who's the secondary players around that? So is it in attacking practice, your secondary player might be, your secondary unit might be around your nine. Um, the decisions bit is to have challenges within your practice, whereas you challenge your players to make decisions. So it's not just about, although your theme might be on, on the forward passing in that area, you're also looking at their decision making within there as well. So you're brush stroking a little bit as well onto another corner. And finally, is the difference, probably more at level three, level four, is this is where when it's been mentioned um, that you may set individual objectives for individual players. So an example could be your five and nine. Your five could be looking at preventing from the opponent from turning, where the nine may be concentrating solely on receiving when marked tightly. So they might be matched up within that practice. But that's two areas that you may look at with um, them two players. Um, Peter Richardson, just if for four days again, I'll repeat it. Direction, definition, decisions, and difference. Anything stand out for you, Andy? Uh, ben Wilkie's asked one here. Um, any suggestions around getting physical returns if only having a small practice area? So physical returns, okay. Um, Tonight is more around the tech chat, but on the physical returns, you've got to think about how you're going to measure that. Um, so in essence, what would your theme be? Uh, one that comes to the top of my head at the moment, again, I don't know what size of area we've got, but if you did a running with the ball practice, you're thinking about physical returns in that, uh, particularly in a technical practice, or you could design... A, a practice where you're working in an area of that pitch that you've got, where it might be an overflow, under, sorry, over, over and under with regards to numbers, and they may break out to go through into a finishing area where the one may break out to cross it and the other one may break out to finish inside the box. So in essence, you'll have... Um, a physical return, but the question I would ask you is how you were going to measure that. How would you measure that physical return? Does that just, just just to jump in as well, Clark? I think in terms of the physical corner, if you're looking within small areas, was it Ben? I think Ben asked the question around physical returns. It's obviously going to be short and sharp. It's going to be high intensity stuff. You're going to be constantly involved in the game. Um, you're going to have those little physical one v one battles with players constantly. But a big thing as well linked to the psych stuff will be about not necessarily being able to switch off, but also not being able to reflect. So if you're working within bigger areas, technically you might not be tested as much and you might not make as many decisions, but physically you're going to be tested in different ways. And from a psych point of view, you're going to have more opportunities to rest, 
to maybe reflect therefore um, and to consider what's happened within the game. Whereas in those smaller areas, you're going to be really tested technically. You're going to have to make quick decisions. Physically, you're going to be tested in different ways, but you're also going to have to make lots of decisions with very little time to be able to review your own performance within live games or live sessions as such. Yeah, the, the only thing I would say to that is, is if you get the challenge right, you'll get the tempo and the intensity right, and then the physical will will come with that. Yeah, uh, true. But again, just thinking about if that's your main focus on the evening uh, or for your session, you've got to really think about um, how you measure that intensity because um, coming into games or coming into a practice next time, how would you measure how intense they worked in that previous session to the one that you're going to go into? What what returns are you looking for from your players? Okay. Um, just moving on to tech tactics. Uh, we're going to look at them key factors, which is linked to the DNA, um, to cover a number of detailed key points. And I've got individual unit team. And tactical, if necessary, is it relevant to your age phase or players? So when we talk about the key factors linked to the DNA, if we just look at the technical components, um, particularly if you're working as, as a level one stroke two, you may want to look in a, a technical practice where you look at passing, dribbling, finishing, turning, uh, receiving, and also running with the ball. Or in defending, intercepting, pressurizing, marking and covering. If you're a level two going up to level three, you might then want to incorporate um, principles of play, looking at penetration, create space, support, movement and creativity. Or if you're looking in the defending area of press, delay, deny, dictate, sorry, press, delay, cover, balance, com, uh, compactness, control, and restraint. If it's three and above, consider your phases. Uh, how, how would you retain and build, penetrate progress, create and score? Or if you're working out of possession, how would you press, delay, deny, dictate, emergency defending as a team? So on the tactical bit, uh, the reason why I put if necessary, it, we've got to think about what tactics is about. Is it something that you want to do to prevent an opposition or is it something you want to do to work to the strengths of your team? So you've got to think about within your practice how you're going to achieve that. Also, it might think about with a tactical bit as an individual. Uh, tactically, how do I close that ball down? Um, if I'm a fullback, is it a tactic from our from our club or our team to send the player inside? So again, it's learning about um, how they would do that as a player. Anything to add, fellas? Not from me, Graham, no. No. Okay. And just to cover on the four corner outcomes, uh, is as we've just said earlier, it depends on we, we're looking fundamentally tonight at the tech tack, but. Physical, social, psychological, decide which corner is your key focus. Something you may want to develop as, your, as you progress and gain experience. So research it, go out. There is a, a number of um, journals out there and research out there with, with regards to where you can pick up um, some sessions around each one of them corners. One that comes to mind with, with social. If you think about your practice, you're going to start with an arrival activity. Do the players take ownership of that? Do they organise themselves? It's just something you may want to think about because in the long term, who really makes them decisions out there? And I think you'll find that's down to the players. Okay. Anything to add? I think just, just quickly, I suppose, linking to everything you're speaking about there, you, you might be doing some stuff on tech and tack. But dependent upon your level of experience, maybe as a coach and how much access you've had to the holistic stuff and the four corner stuff, the physical, social cycle come out as a byproduct. You might not have necessarily planned it within your session. You might be focused purely on the tech and tack, but the other stuff might come out as a byproduct. Equally, having said that, go back to what Graham said earlier about some individual learning plans. And what might happen is you plan your tech tack around the collective group. But you might have some individual stuff where you go, you know what, I need to work with this player on this tonight 
and I might need to add a little bit of this in for this player as well. And they might be around the other four corners. Equally, it might be a little bit of specific stuff around the tech and tack for individuals as well. But you might be going tech and tack for the collective group. But there's a few little elements of uh, physical that I might need to work with one and two players. And there might be a bit of social stuff for player C. And there might be a little bit of psych that I might want to add into my plan to work with player D. So that might come down to your individual stuff where you look to support those individuals as part of that collective group. Just just to add, uh, answer one question that's came in here. Um, what is tech and TAC? So I just want to clarify that for, for some people. Okay, the technical bit is, um, look at, for me, it's looking down at a fundamental um, and, and execution of a, a technique, for argument's sake, a passing, dribbling, a finishing, uh, a turning, a run with the ball, if we want to look at uh, attacking. Uh, technically, sorry, tactically, is, is how do we do that? Um, how do we, with our teams, how are we going to break down the opposition? Um, as an individual, how am I going to close that ball? How am I going to support that player? Um, what's the trigger in for if a ball's played into a certain player? Is that a trigger for me to move? So this... Most uh, uh, most coaches normally in the game were quite generic in what we deliver. <clears throat> However, when you start working with, um, if you're working at Northern League level and above, there's a consideration that you may go out and watch oppositions and come back and plan practices tactically, but with a technical slant, slant within it. Hope that's answered your question. Cheers, Grim. Um, just, just on there's a, there's a couple of books to if you want to particularly around the um, physical. Uh, Tony Strudwick, Soccer Science. It's a very good book with regards to all that information on a physical side. But there's quite a few um, session plans in there specifically around developing that physical corner. And also there's a one, uh, Coaching Psychological Skills in Youth Football, Developing the Five Cs, with, which is written by Chris Howard and Rich Anderson. But as, as Rich um, alluded to, in every practice that we do, these all overlap. Tonight is just for you to sort of consider one first of all, and just then build on it there, from there. Okay. Anything to add? Yeah, there's just a question come in here from Steve Dix. Um, should we as coaches be highlighting the physical, psychological, and social areas to the players and not just the tech and tack? Is it needed in order to show the players the importance of all those corners and not just the tech and tack? The answer to that, yes. Um, but consider what you have on that evening, Steve, with regards to... Um, time your group if you've got that time to to split off and, and add more well fine but um from my own personal perspective it would be very difficult if i want to specifically drill down in one area and then try to add the other areas in the time scale that i have on an evening but you're right it does overlap um however just tonight what i'm trying to do particularly for the level ones who have joined us are level twos, just to just initially focus on one area. And then once you get an understanding of that, start looking at the other areas and start building. Okay. If you notice the course delivery that we've done, we've touched things on level two. We've, we've drilled down a little further, but um, I would ask all of you is how many do you actually would go out and just deliver a social um, practice on an evening? How many have actually done that? And if you've done, if you want to share that with us, please do so. I think just, sorry, Rich. Sorry, just, just to jump in as well, um, just for Steve. Hope you're well, by the way, Steve. Um, obviously, you did the UA for B with me and Graham uh, 12, 18 months or so back. You think about part of the course was about profiling players. So roles and responsibilities of players with regards to the tech and tack corner. But then also looking at your individual players across the other corners, so looking at them psych psychologically, socially and physically. So your role would then be 
I suppose, to have some sort of discussion with your players around the support mechanisms that you're putting in place to try and help and support them. Some of the stuff you might not. Some of the stuff you might just put in knowing what you're doing to try and help and support them. Some of it might be a direct conversation. But again, going back to the individual learning plans, you might be doing something on, I don't know, playing out from the back, for example, and you might be looking at the, your number five who's not particularly confident at getting on the ball to play out and play through. So then you might be looking at the mechanisms that you might put in place to help and support that number five. And it might be with regards to the confidence. It might be with regards to their physical capabilities to get in, to receive, receiving in the right body shape, etc. Or it might be about the tech and tack around being able to deal with the ball and then their game understanding as to where to go next. So a lot of that will come through your player profiling before you can then step in and help those individuals again as part of that collective. Sorry, Graham. Andy? No, that's me. I've just noticed down there that um, some of these have done um, practices on communication. What would be interesting to me is, is how did you achieve that and how did you set that objective? So if you want to just add a little bit more detail to that, that would be, that'd be quite interesting. Um, otherwise, anything else to add, fellas, before we move it on? Oh, just looking on... Have you moved it on, Rich, have you? Looks like you uh -huh. have. Sorry. It's okay, mate. I was just looking, thinking. Just move it on to the next one for us then, Rich, if you don't mind. So the one where I was at? Yeah, next one in. Yeah. So just adding to that, which might open up a little bit more now, is your format and practice format. Um, things for you to think about. Do you work in a whole part whole? Is any is done any chaining, um, carousel, practice formats to think about, particularly at level one and two, uh, technique, skill to small side of game, um, looking at a constant variable or, 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 or random practices, a way of practice if you're at maybe it's two to three, a functional practice again at three, four, phases of play and 11 v 11 formats there. So take a moment, um, think about a question you may want to ask just on that format, and then we'll look. To, you anything to add, Rich, um, Andy, on just format, practical format? No, a more format. Just in the chat. Well, there's a, there's a question come in um, a bit earlier, actually, which links in nicely with this. Um, it's from Linda in the Hutchin, and she's asked, how do you deal uh, with mixed ability groups? Some need more repetition than others. So differentiation, um, again, you may the constant variable random may be something where you may want to go, or is if it's a technique, if you want to consider thinking about, if you want to involve all of them in a technique, you may want to do that with no threat to the ball. So the individual then is just concentrating solely on that technique you want him or her to, to work on, or you may want to, buddy that individual either young young boy or young girl together with somebody else with a little bit more working with his or her buddy um and <clears throat> then you may when you go from there just to challenge them a little bit you may then want to go to an overload underload in a, in a skill practice where there's a little challenge on them with a threat to the ball um however if if it's not happening for them on that evening you may want to take it a step back or there's a consideration you might just set up something else alongside and just give them an opportunity to uh, do what we call individual learning plan uh, and let them actually practice um, alongside the rest of the group. Anything to add on that, boys? Just, just, uh, small, just the small-sided stuff that if you were going to work in a small-sided game as well and you were wanting to try and keep your players in the small-sided and you didn't want to break out and you didn't want to do individual stuff, just the recognition of the numbers that you work with. So if you want to get more repetition of a technical return, you're obviously going to work smaller numbers. So you might, if you might have been playing a 5v5 game as an example and you're not getting the amount of repetition that you want, do you drop it and play a 2 versus 3 and a 2 versus 3 and have two parallel games taking place? you play two versus two um so just consider your numbers 
And does it need to be the same on both pitches? So depending upon the number of players you've got, you might have a four versus four taking place on one pitch and a two versus two taking place on the other pitch. Very much depends on what you're working on. Very much depends on who needs help within your group. But just that, if you want to stay within the small-sided, consider the makeup of your practice, going back to Clark, he's mentioned earlier about area of size and pitch, um, but the number of players that are playing. Do you go overloaded, underloaded? Do you go smaller numbers to 2v2 compared to 5v5? Andy, anything to add? Uh, no. No, thanks. OK. Um, looking at logistics, area size, um, consider how that's going to challenge your players. The number of players you have, we've got the step, which um, is space, task, equipment and players. Visual aids. Um, if you've got visual aids, a tactics board, use them. And also sometimes let your players use them because um, they may be able to want to add things themselves and you're checking for understanding throughout. And the other thing as well, think about your phase. Are you working in a foundation phase, youth development, which is open age, or an 18 plus? And with that, the challenge within there may be, well, will be considerably different. So anything on logistics, fellas, you may want to add to that. Got any questions on that? No, there's nothing come through as yet. Okay. Now, I've just added this a little bit. Thinking about your coaching philosophy, the big thing for me is your, is your behaviours, particularly when you're face-to-face. -face. Is it consistent? What is your manner like? Your tone? Are you patient? Do you have empathy? Because there will be mistakes throughout, and it, it's important that them young players or any players are allowed to flourish without concern about making mistakes and, and being worried about it. The big one in for me in the middle is how do I influence and impact on my players? Use of dis different coaching intervention stars. So when we talk about that, we're talking about um, on the coaching stars, are you a command type with regards to um, show and tell or Q&A? Do you ask the questions and the guide discovery side of that is getting them to show you. Again, trial and error, asking the player to try something. And if it doesn't work, asking that same player, think about why and what you may do differently. Now, with your intervention styles, there's consideration to, to continue to have a flow within your practice is to have little flybys while the practice is going on, is taking the player at the side and just having that conversation. Um, Socratic, Socratically ask them what their thoughts are and then just shape and guide them. Or it may be a little breather where you bring it to to the to the side where you just said what I want you to do now is just observe and watch so and so and see what he or she's doing and then that gives them a picture and, and then it's a case of can you go back over there and have a go at it okay so on the playing philosophy bit is how do I want my teams to play so there's lots and lots some teams want to play through some teams want to go into a final third area that is down to you. But think about what the trade-offs are. If you're looking to develop in certain ways, that if it's a, if it's a straightforward ball in behind the opposition, how was our players in a midfield area development? So it's something you may want to consider. Anything just, out of Rich, Andy? Yeah, just before you go on, can you um, explain what chaining means and just, just clarify that a little bit? Okay. Um, with the chaining... Uh, let's just take crossing and to a finish. So initially what you may do is develop the cross. So just working on the crossing practice. And if, you, if you've been involved in crossing practices, the amount of crosses that come into the area initially, they're all over the place. So we're getting runs from plates, receiving nothing. So what you might do is just, some may work on just crossing the ball into an area, crossing the ball into an area. Then you're going to add or the runs of players to that to finish. So in essence, we're chaining the practice. So what we are finding there, we have a practice which is crossing and finishing. Does that explain that for you? You happy? Anything you want to come back on on that? No, cheers, Graham. Okay, Rich, anything you want to add? 
No, mate, all good. Okay. Move to the next slide, yeah. Yes, please. Okay, um, <clears throat> what we have done is, as, as part of this workshop tonight, we've done a, or we've got a session plan template for everybody. So this will be available, on, was it Monday? Yeah, we we'll sent it through Monday, yeah. Um, and all I'm going to do is very sort of quickly go through this. Um, straightforward, so you've got your organisation, your session information, which may be um, what you, your key objective is, the coaching points which you may want to look at, and any adaptations. So you may be moving from a, a technique to a skill to a small signing. So within that, yes, Rich, go on to the next, if you don't mind. So all this will be movable. So you can insert your practice title in there, and you've got a little toolkit, and then you can put your players in where you want. You can work on the shapes that you would like, um, and then you can print it off. And if you just want to move it on again, Rich, some of the areas that have been um, sectioned off, so you may want to work in specific areas or have a constraint um, in an area for some players, and that might be a case of a, as a goalkeeper, the ball's fed at the fullback. You might just be working on long passing for the for the fullback, and the restriction on the fullback is part of one of the three R's might be that he can only play the ball into the final third or the final quarter. So he's working specifically on long passing. So that might be just for him. Do you want to move to the next one, Rich? Sorry. There you go. Sorry. Are we going the right way? Hold on. Fingers are all over. Yeah, Sorry. next one. Yeah. So again, that one, that's just a, an area where you may want to adapt things and play. And if you're thinking about it as a level four, if you may want to consider looking at um, combining practices where um, for maintain to build a counter-attack might be in there where you've got a, an offside line set a little deeper and working on one team to defend deep. Um, on the, another practice, you might offset the goals where you attack it centrally um, for the other team to then break wide and finish from crosses. Or you might want to split the pitch again and just work on full-backs Go back one, Rich, still. You might want to work on full backs, so splitting the pitch and put the goals on the same side where you can work on left and right back. So there's lots of things you can do with that template. So if you want to move on one, Rich, please. Next template, please. Sorry, mate. You Sorry, it's okay. The last one, go on, next one, please. Just back one, Rich. Last one. So your last one in there, so you've got a circle. That might be a consideration in the beginning with your arrival activity or looking at turning in there and dribbling or a technical sort of component that you may want to work on. So what you've got with the template itself is a, a number of diagrams that you can adapt to suit you and in, in your players. Anything add, Rich, Andy? No, I think it's all there for them. The toolkit's there just for them to use and adapt as needed. So if you go back to that one, for example, obviously quarters at the moment, might be half a pitch, might be thirds, might be channels, um, all the key information to the side, as you'll see in terms of player movement, ball movement. So it should pretty much, with all of them, cover everything that you kind of need within reason. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Andy. No, as you can see, it's pretty comprehensive. It's a far side better than my pen and paper. So Steve's just put there, where do I find that? Steve, it'll be available on Monday, so you'll be able to download it straight away for yourself. Okay, let's move okay. on. Yeah. There we go. So as I said um, tonight, I just looked at the, the technical corner. Um, and what we've looked at here is just breaking it down from the DNA. And if you notice on the slide there, um, it's been added that if you just click on there, you'll go into the website where you'll get the, the DNA from uh, the England DNA. But on, if we're looking at passing qualities, what I've put up there, if you look at on a technique, so if we talked about a constant practice, you were then drilling down, watching your individual player, or players looking at their non-kicking foot, kicking foot, part the ball, head steady, and follow through. 
And as a coach, if you've got the detail, you'll be able to help them a little bit. So if I've got a practice where there's no threat to the ball, they're solely concentrating on that technique. So there's not a concern of somebody closing them down. So level one, initially at level one, that will that will help you. And also, it certainly at three and four and two, that as your players improve and you put them into more challenging situations, that if the fundamentals are smooth and clean, moving it on again, they will be able to execute that technique very well under pressure. So moving into a skill practice, which may be um, variable to random, where there could be a threat to the ball, so overload, underload. The player on the ball is looking at a disguise, so dropping a shoulder and going the other way. Then looking at a selection. Now, that type selection type, you think about the different types of passes. Now, this all incorporates the technique. In the time of the release, the pace and weight, does it get there? Is it accurate? Now, as well as looking at that, you're also looking at the technique. So if it, if it connects well, over a distance, you can also say in your own mind, I'm pretty competent, my, well, my player's pretty competent at that, at that execution. If not, you have got to start looking at the reason why. And it may be in the skill area or it may be in the, in the technique area. On the small side of game, now that's linked to your DNA. Um, if you're a level three, two, and you're looking at a small side of game, you're incorporating all them key factors now. So your player's individual technique, his or her understanding through when, when there's pressure applied, and now we're looking at when they're on the ball, can they look to penetrate? Um, if not, can they look to create space to penetrate? Is the movement in front of him? So we're now looking around and away from the ball. What is the support? So is it from behind or in front? And when we get into that sort of final third area, can we ask our players to be creative or even whilst on the ball, on the ball, consider can they do it in a different way? So creativity is all about doing it in a different way. So fundamentally, what we're doing is bringing it all together. Now, if you're working it or you're a level three, level four, you may then consider looking at your phases, um, particularly how we might maintain and build, where we might maintain and build. How do we penetrate and progress? How do we create and score? Now, that's going to incorporate everything in there. So you as a coach, if you've got that information and, and there's, a, there's a breakdown, you'll be able to specifically pinpoint that and you may be able to go in and do something about it. Now, that takes time. Now, I've left out the counterattacking on the phase or the phases, and simply the reason why I've done that is fundamentally, if you're going to work on counterattacking, you're going to have to work on your team, first of all, defending deeper to be able to exploit space to break out. So is anything you want to add to that, Rich, Andy? I think, I think my, go on, Andy. No, go on, mate. I was just thinking from my perspective is it, it's important that everyone understands where the players are at as well. And if you're working with brand new players just coming in at under sevens, they may not be able to do the disguise, the time and the accuracy. So expecting that's going to be unrealistic and you're heavily going to focus on the technique elements. So it's known where your players are at in the different age groups. Obviously, if you work in 16s, 18s, you may just tweak the, te the technique as and when needed, but you're probably going to focus more on the small side than the skill element. So again, it's just understanding where your players are at and appreciating that as well. Yeah, well, just uh, just to add to that, just in my experience um, working as the lead coach at Hartlepool at the foundation phase, all in our coaching cycle, the players in the foundation phase was the coaches were delivering sessions specifically around the technique because we needed them to be smooth and clean in their execution. So working at the younger age groups, it was more around the technique and when you talk about the skill practice, and, you, and you're very right, Andy, um, there's a considering there with your um, over and under, overload, underload. And if you just think about a 4v1, just looking at it, a 4v1 where four are on the outside of the box and there's only one on the inside, and they've got that protection of working up to the line, 
where some of them elements about, particularly on time release, they can think about when they're letting the ball go. Uh, and if it's intercepted, it's an opportunity for you to go in there. Or if it's not played at the right weight, will it be intercepted? And then the challenge, and we put somebody else into that square. So there's, there's ways around it by breaking it back into a, a, a small area and just challenge your players to see where they are. And, but as you said earlier, Andy, you're absolutely right. You, you need to consider where your players are. Having said that, if you're working at three and four and we're into the bigger picture, I think and it's really important that we, we don't lose sight of them fundamentals. So when we talk about how our practice is put together um, and we've gone into a, maybe it's a, a whole part whole, the part bit might be uh, their own opportunity then to do just some fundamentals, working with each other, uh, range of passing, um, simple little practices, so they still, still are keeping up to speed with their technique. So you cannot, cannot stop altogether just not, not practicing that. Any add, Rich? Um, I think it's getting the balance into Graham. I think the, the England DNA stuff places a massive emphasis on working within small-sided games and game-related practices. But the reality is with those younger players, if you can't master the ball, you'll never master the game. And I think the whole constant practice stuff over recent years, wrongly, has been seen as a bit of a swear word, where actually it's massively important and probably something that if any of you have returned to coaching over the you know, recent weeks, a lot of the work that you'll have been doing will be constant practices and reinforcing that technical stuff. Um, but it's getting the balance. Because if we only do it in isolation and we only do the technical work, then when we come to apply it within a game, you, you're kind of relearning it to an extent. So it's getting that balance around giving them lots of opportunities to trial and play and do stuff within games, whilst recognising some real key opportunities to go and work on those technical returns. And as I say, if you can't master the ball, you'll never master the game. But how can you get that balance right? And going back to Andy, and I think Graham's point as well, it's about knowing your players. What do your players need? How can you best help them? Andy, any out, outstanding question? I see one. Is it from Ben Wilkie? Yeah, that's the one I was just about to put to you. If you can read it. Um, I've got so much of it. For the youngest players under seven and looking at technical technique practice, any suggestions on keeping this fun and engaging? I can't see the bottom bit. Um, he's basically saying he spends a lot of time in small-sided games, which is what they enjoy, but maybe not focus wholly on the technique. OK. Um, one that comes to mind is a skills corridor. Um, which um, is working on the, the youngsters working down the skills corridor, doing I've a certain... Got, just to jump in, Graham, sorry, I've got something like that to show later on, which might bring it to life a bit more. OK. So well, we, can, we can... Yeah, so for that, Ben, I would consider a skills corridor. I'll let Rich, when he comes into his social distancing bit, I think yeah. uh, he's going to... He's going to explain that a little bit more. I think just on the, just for Ben as well, just on that small-sided stuff, um, don't necessarily need to answer this now yourself, but what size games, again, are you playing? Because is a 1v1 a small-sided game? I, I would say so. One player playing against another, you go back to Graham's point around the direction. So if there's direction involved and you're playing 1v1 or 1v2 or 2v1 or whatever it may be, you're still getting that small-sided element. You're still getting the competition, but you're getting lots more opportunities to work on your technique and your skill, or obviously your skill, but applying your technique at the right time. Um, and as Graham says, practices like your skills corridor, which you might do as an arrival activity, um, you'll get loads and loads of repetition without going back to the point earlier, getting too repetitive. But if you think about your small-sided games, how can you design your pitch? How can you consider the number of players? Who plays against who? Is it a 1v1? Is it a 1v2? And the best players playing against two slightly weaker players. But how can you manipulate your practice, your area size, your number of players to still get some real game realism whilst getting loads and loads of repetition? Moving on, Grim. Please. So, um, what we put up there is the England coaching DNA fundamentals. And, and really, it's just sort of revisiting what we've done. So I'd rather you just have a look at that. And if there's anything that sticks out that you'd, you'd like to ask about, uh, please do so. But it's really just embedding what we've looked at earlier. Um, anything to add, Rich, Andy, on that? 
I think a big one for me that jumps out on this at the moment, I think a lot of the stuff you've already talked about, Graham, is is embedded within there. And obviously, you've got a few more points to come. Big ones around that 70% ball rolling time. Now, we've always said as two as myself, Graham, Andy and Dave, who's on the call around, don't get too caught up with that because that could become a little bit messy because you could go down the route of, well, we're just letting the players go and play, but we've not actually helped them. What we do want is more of them and less of us as coaches. And I think the reason I'm highlighting that now is that's massively important as we come back to football in whatever shape and form, because you're going to have players coming back, regardless of age, level of experience, etc. They might not have played football for three months. So the last thing they're probably going to want is to return to your training session tomorrow or next week or in a month's time, whenever that may be, and be stood around listening to you talk. So I think that 70% ball rolling time becomes really big over the next few weeks and months moving forwards, letting them play, letting them experiment, but recognising there's a real key point where you can get in and go and help them. Yeah, it, it, just to add to that, um, I've always wrestled with it because every single body, uh, every single person who's on here tonight is a coach. Um, it, sometimes you turn up on a, on a practice on an evening and you may not have any idea what sort of day that person's had, whether it's school or work, and they come in and for whatever reason they're not motivated, sometimes you're going to have to go in and work. Or sometimes you'll come in and, and everything just flows, your practice flows, and you think, wow. And then the same practice maybe is a couple of weeks later and you look and think, have I ever coached with these? So we aim to get this 70% ball rolling, but there's times where you as a coach, you're going to have to drive it and get in there and support them and help them and um, motivate them to to do what what you need. Because um, fundamentally, if you've set a practice up and took the time to do it, at some point you'll want some returns as well. Anything else on that, Andy? No, yeah, it's, it's spot on, Graham. It's, it's about being clever as well with your interventions. And if the point you're making, is it is it necessary or can it wait till a drinks break? Can it wait till later? Can it wait till half time? Um, it's, do you have to stop the whole play to work with one player when you could maybe just drift over, have a little word with them while the ball's at the other side of the field? So it's just trying to be really clever with how you intervene and work with the players. And if you need to create a whole picture for the group, then yes, stop it, create it. But if it's just one individual who doesn't need the whole picture, then just wait till they're not directly involved in play and then make that little point with them then. And that will help you keep the ball rolling more. Okay, you want to move it on, Rich? There you go, mate. So, uh, regarding the delivery of the practical session, I, I want you to consider the following. This is again in your planning, but also it's reflecting when in action. So, is the practice purposeful and realistic? Is it challenging and competitive? Is there an emphasis on quality? Is it enjoyable? Is there intensity and tempo to the practice? Now, they're the questions you should be asking yourself throughout. Um, and if you also ask yourself while it's happening, um, would I like to take part in the practice? I mean, personally, I'm a great believer if something's not working, don't stay with it. If you need to tweak an area size that the players are struggling because it's too small, make it bigger. Or, or after it, on your review, review what you've done and... and don't be overcritical. Just look at things that you may want to tweak. It, it's never going to happen normally on that first attempt. It's going to take a number of practices before you might be happy with what you call as a, as a best practice. But the question I always ask myself is, would I like to take part in the practice? And some of that reflection that I'm going back home in the car, I'm thinking, that didn't go where I wanted it tonight. So anything to add, Rich? Andy on that? No, no I, think I, I think you just nailed that point at the end, though, Graham, that regardless of your level of um, coaching qualification, regardless of how long you've been coaching, it's not always going to go to plan. You know, you might walk away from it, you might review it and reflect upon it and go, you know what, didn't quite work tonight, but then that's got to inform your next plan and then going back to your little kind of checklist there. So your review stuff becomes really important to kind of inform where you go next. Next slide. Yes, please. So uh, just look at the summary that we talk about the what, when, when, why, um, the what, is it an individual or a role objective or a unit objective or a team objective? That's for you to decide. 
whether it's for all the individuals or at individuals within a unit. Um, when does it happen in a game? Is it due to the state of the game? Is it an in possession, out possession, or due in transition? Where is it on the pitch? Is it an attack and stroke defending objective? And why is it happening? Is it a repetitive situation? Again, is it an individual or collective? Again, is it in possession, out possession, or due in transition? So what, when, where, and why? And I think if we move on to the next one, Rich. How um, can I do this well? You're looking at yourself. Um, the format, can I be creative in my planning? Who is involved? Which players? Um, are they part of a, what we call as a primary unit, secondary, or others? We've talked about the step. So well, how much space do you have? What is the task? How much equipment and the players? And again, with the group, uh, age of group, foundation phase, youth development phase, open age, so important is information detail you provide will determine how you can stimulate, challenge, and check your plan, learning, and understanding. And we've just added a little bit at the bottom again is, is time. I noticed um, right at the beginning of the webinar, a lot of you talked about that you, you'd, you only had an hour. Um, and some of you were planning a little, just literally going up there. But also, you didn't have a great deal of time in your practice. You've got to look at maximize what you would like to do. So for me, it's really important in your format is how much time you spend on that. And can you get the balance right between the bit of learning and the bit of playing for them at the end? Um, Andy, Rich, anything to add on that? Not from me, mate. No, not, not from me either. Okay, any questions on that from anybody on the... If you just go back to the slide, Rich, on the what, when, where, why, and again, forward, the how, who, with the step in the group. No questions? There's nothing come through as yet. Okay. Um, the focus was on the technical corner, meaning what you add to the other three corners is, is blending the practice. I think we've repeated that through the, the webinar. However, this will be brushstroke rather than emphasise. Uh, I think it's important that you don't overload yourself because if you're overloading yourself, how does that work with your players? Um, for me, I tend to work in one particular area only, brushstroke on the other, and then maybe emphasise that corner on another even a little bit more in detail. OK, so uh, any questions from anybody? Guys, now now's your time because we're gonna shortly we're gonna move on to some stuff for 15 minutes or so around social distance stuff. Um, if you have got questions, please throw them in the chat function now for Graham rather than leaving them to the very end. So just give yourselves a minute. Any questions, fire over. And then if you just look at that top question as well, around based on what Graham's just delivered there, um, any changes you might make to your planning and practice design. Um, stuff that you might already be doing, which is just reinforce your own thinking, or as I say, any kind of key questions whilst well, you've got Graham now, now's your time to ask him. I can't see the chat function, Graham, so it's over to you and Brownie. Can you see that one from Kevin, Graham? Yeah, I have one player on my team who's technically gifted, but his strengths let him down in turn. Means the team has to carry him in games. And sticking with him instead of moving him into the development team as I can see the potential of the player. Apart from sticking him on the weights, how can I improve his strength? So it's a physical... How so old is he? Yeah, how old is he, Kevin? Kevin, how old is the young player? Oh, he's an under 10. <laughs> Okay, um, I wouldn't, I would personally, I wouldn't worry too much about if you're telling me or you've stated that he's technically gifted, um, just consider things with him at the moment because physically he's going to develop as he gets older anyway. Uh, weights is, is something you really shouldn't consider as of yet. Muscle grows faster than bone in a young athlete anyway. So, I, as an under 10 who's Maybe slightly not strong at the moment, as you say. 
Just ask him to see if he can and do things a little quicker. Can he shape his body to receive it and move it faster? Or can he get into an area where he's got a little bit more space and time? So I wouldn't really be too concerned about any form of strength conditioning for that young is it, are you male or female? I hope that answers it for you. Anything to add on that, Rich, Andy? No, I think you've nailed it there. Just, just remember, Kev, he's, he's 10 year old. That's just, just the biggest point. He's 10 year old. Just remember that as part of his own development as an individual. But I think Graham has nailed it in terms of the points he's raised. Okay. Any other questions come through, Andy? Um, no. Oh, okay, funny. Uh, Mark, hold on, Mark Radwell's asked one here. I just nearly missed it. Uh, so, Rich, just returning back to one of my previous questions. Um, as much as we need to do practice around what players need, we need to be what's that? we need to be careful of doing too much reactionary coaching because of what might be seen in the game on Saturday. Uh, we get peaks and troughs from reactionary coaching. So, I think what he means by that is. They have a, a bad defensive day on Saturday. I'm going to work defensive, that sort of thing. I uh, I think if you, I'm just going to go right back. You go right back there, and I think Mark. I don't know what age group you're working with him, but I think you're working within that younger age group. There shouldn't be any reaction to what's happened in a performance at, at that kind of foundation phase, because the reality is going back to the other point. They, they're still kids. They're still developing, so you might have that technical program in place to support and help those players. If you even look at, um, so an example I used on a recent UEFA B course with Graham around reacting to performances as well. I had a situation I remember years ago where we played against a team two, three years ago that, that defended with a mid block, and the team I was working with really struggled to to play through or play around or play over that mid block. So then, what I did straight away session the following week was reacted to that and put a session on playing through a mid block but then when it came to the game on the weekend the team that we came up against weren't playing with a mid block so you've got to think about your collective group of players and your individuals and are we reacting to something are we setting something up for what's coming in the next game if you're working maybe with more senior players or actually if we just got a technical development program in place and we don't really shift away from that because we believe in it and actually we're working on something to help and support the players over the long term rather than reacting to something that's just happened. Now, probably worth highlighting at this point that a discussion that myself, Graham and Dave had was that maybe following this webinar this evening, we might look to put some additional support stuff on around either webinars or face to face when that returns around maybe how we look towards developing a technical programme or around how we react to a weekend performance or how we set up based on a team that we're coming up against. So just something like a consideration that we might look to do, but that'll be very much based on your feedback as coaches. So right at the very end, we'll be asking you um, to give us feedback and we'll be asking you to kind of give us some kind of thoughts around what additional help and support you want. But I would very much say that if you're working in the foundation phase and probably even youth development phase, you've got that programme in place and you're not going to react to something that's happened on a weekend because the reality is that might be a one-off performance from your group or it might be some individual er errors from individual players. Andy, Graham, anything to add in? No, I think just um, just on tonight's webinar with that, just a little bit on how would you develop your session plan based on tonight's webinar. So once you get your template now, you, you may want to consider just doing a, a session plan and, and send it in just for us to have a look at and see how, how you've seen tonight with your feedback, but actually doing a session plan. Something to consider. That's, that's, that's it then, Rich. Any more questions, Andy, or we move on? Just conscious of time, we've got about 10 minutes left. Yeah, I think we need to just move on. Move it on. Lovely. Right, OK. Um, Right, guys, just for the next 10 minutes, again, if you do have any kind of questions, just feel free to bang them in the chat box and we'll try where we can to help them. However, what I'm going to say is we don't have the answers at the moment. So with regards to returning to training and this whole return to football and social distance stuff, as you'll have seen, the situation starting to evolve a little bit. Now, we're not the decision makers. 
So as a county FA and the three of us that are on this at the moment, we have no more insight as to what is currently happening behind the scenes as what you guys have got. So we're very much waiting on um, further information from the Football Association, which links in through the Department for Culture, Media and Sport and the government. So you'll see that I've just put on the top of this slide tweet that went out last night from the National FA saying that they're working on further guidance that will be released in due course, but currently to continue to follow the guidance that's been in place since the 4th of July. OK, now the guidance that comes out again, we don't know when that's going to come out. So it might come out tomorrow, which might change the whole situation. It might be a couple of weeks down the line. We literally don't know what's going to happen. What I would say at this point is two things. One, when the guidance does come out, when and if and when it changes, if you need any additional support, feel free to give the county FA um, a call and we'll try and help and support where we can. Um, but also don't react too quickly. Now, what we've seen, if I just move on to the next slide, what we've probably not as much what we've seen personally, but some information that's come through to the county FA over recent weeks is that some um, maybe clubs, some teams, some coaches possibly aren't going down the lines that they should be at the moment with regards to the social distance training. So we just wanted to kind of highlight at this point, and again, we appreciate it might change, but as it stands, it hasn't. We just want to um, highlight a couple of points here before I give you some more kind of information that might help you in the long run. So if you don't already know, and hopefully you do, currently as it stands, as of what, seven o'clock, eight o'clock tonight on Friday evening, there shouldn't be any games taking place at the moment. And therefore, there shouldn't be any contact be, uh, between players and or the coaches, which obviously means that social distancing around the two metres or if needed, that one metre distance should be in place at all times. The biggest question that we've had coming through as a county FA at the moment is around the ratios. So if you are working currently and you only have one group of players, the ratio is two adults to four players. So if you're working with young people or children, it's two coaches to four players. Now, of those two, both need to have a DBS, but only one of those needs to be a coach because you'll have one coach driving the session with those four players. But you need to ensure that there are two people as part of that group of six that have their DBS. Rich, now, if you're I, in a, sorry, mate, can I just jump in on the DBS bit there as well? Oh, sure. Yep. It's um, important that you all remember the DBS must be in date and it also must be on your fan number as in date and accepted. Now, there's a lot of people get confused around the fact they've submitted it, they think they're OK or they've received the certificate back from um, the organisation and they think it's OK. The FB will actually assess them individually and then add that to your fan number. So it's very important that you follow that process and then only act once it's shown on your fan number. And that includes assisting the coach as well. So I just want to just try and clear that up. Lovely. Um, and then, yeah, based on where you're potentially doing your training and the space that you might have available, um, there is obviously the capacity as it currently stands to be working with five players um, in multiple groups, which would therefore change the ratio to one coach to five players um, who has the DBS because... I don't know, let's say 10 yards away, there's another session taking place with another coach from your team or club who is a qualified coach and has the DBS in place. Now, I just want to stress at this point, certainly from a personal point of view, not the football police, don't want to preach to you. The, probably the vast majority of people who are out there currently working players are doing some really good stuff and are doing it with the right intentions and are doing it safely. The reason we wanted just to highlight that slide at this moment in time is one, to ensure that you're safeguarded against um, so you're safe, but also your players are safe. And if we do want the game to return, as we all know it, um, we all just need to play our part in this. So as I say, not the football police, but just wanted to highlight because we have had a few questions recently around those ratios and what you can and can't do. If you need any further guidance, as it currently stands, um, the links are there for you to click on. They're all on the FA's website and it'll give you hopefully all of the information that you currently need. And as I say, we're still waiting on the information. And as a county FA and all the staff that are working there, um, we're all very much looking forward to the return of football as we know it as well. But we've just got to go by the guidance that's out there currently. And as I say, when it changes and evolves, um, you'll find that information on the website and you can also give the county FA a call where needed. OK, just a few more points, again, conscious of time. Um, the, the next kind of couple of slides, I'm just going to go through a few points with you. 
the they are very much around social distance stuff um however certainly on this slide around the considerations when planning this would very much link to um whether you're planning a session now for social distance training or whether you're planning a session at any time when working with the players some of the points graham's probably already covered but some of the kind of key questions to kind of ask yourself when you're planning these sessions is again what do the players want and need so why are you putting on a particular session? Have you really considered why you're doing it? Does it meet the needs of the players? Is it going to help and support them right now? And again, that big one around the balance between what they need and what they want, I'd probably lean a little bit more at the moment to what they want as well, bearing in mind where they've been for the past three months and what they're possibly after. So do you consult your players at the moment? Do you consult your parents? Um, and ensure you're getting the right balance within your session around do the players want, <clears throat> excuse me, and need this. Linking to that next point is around will it meet the needs? So you've planned something around what you think the players need. Does your session planning and delivery within these social distance training and moving forward, does that session meet the needs of them as players and as people? Next point down, Clark has obviously mentioned stuff around the four corners. Um, but where do your players currently need the help? So when they come back to your training session, if they've returned already or if they're due to come back in a week or so's time, where do you need to place your emphasis? Where do you need to brush um, stroke over those four corners? So do you need to help them technically? Probably. So you're going to have the balls out. But actually, are there other areas where you really need to help and support your players? So from a physical point of view, what have your players been doing? Have they been active every day? Have they been sat at home on the computers? And um, from a psych and social point of view, possibly not been around other people. Um, outside of their family so just some considerations around yes we're going to help them with the football but also you're going to play a big part in helping them holistically as well next one down is around the support that you're going to offer so link to those four corners watch the specific detail that you're going to help so if you're delivering some one versus one practices at the moment or you're delivering within small groups what technical information can you help the players with to help and support them as an individual player or as part of that small group? And then what information can you help them with? Again, linked to those four corners. Next one, Clark is again mentioned it, but challenging your players. So how can you challenge your players when at the moment you're working in a social distance capacity where there should be no contact, no real engagement with other players and potentially a lack of competition? So what are you going to put in place to challenge your players over the course of that one hour slot that you might have with them? At the moment, and if this stuff, uh, stuff does stay in place for the next two, three weeks, and you've already been training for a few weeks, at the moment it might be all right with the players, but sooner or later they're going to want those games. And if we're not allowed to go into games, how are you going to keep them challenged? And then linking it to the next point, how are you also going to keep their motivation high? How are they or why are they going to want to come back the next week or two days later to do another session with you if they can't engage in what looks like normal football to them. Again, hopefully that will come soon, but at the moment it isn't. Um, and then just the last one, um, everything that we try and do is about providing realism. It's obviously difficult at the moment, but how can you ensure, going back to some of Graham's points around the direction earlier, that you provide as much realism as possible within your small group or your one versus one coaching sessions? Okay. Um, some stuff around when you're actually delivering, just to, again to reinforce some of the points that were mentioned previously. Obviously, your players at the moment, currently as things stand, have to be socially distant from other players. Therefore, a consideration from me, particularly with younger players, is about potentially keeping them in their own allocated areas. Now, if you're working with more senior players, you might be doing some stuff on shadow play or some patterning stuff where... Um, your players are obviously a bit more clued in and they can keep those distances in themselves. But if you're working with younger players, it might be a consideration to try and have them in their own areas to ensure that that social distance stays in place at all times. OK, next point down, though, is that whilst you can't have that physical contact and players can't get close, you need to ensure that your players are socially connected with young players. Not only do they come to your sessions for the football, they're clearly coming to your sessions to engage with you as a coach and engage with their mates within their football team as well. So whilst they can't be physically connected, can you start planning stuff into your sessions now and moving forwards to ensure that your players are socially connected as well and they're having a good time? Um, next point down, stuff around limited equipment. Um, if you, prior to this, 
weren't using, and this is just as an example, but you weren't using things like ladders um, and cones to jump over and poles and stuff, why suddenly would you now get them out? Okay. Also, from the side of things in terms of touching equipment and potentially transferring any kind of infection, and the advice that's given at the moment is to try and use limited equipment. So you'll see something shortly that I've just planned as an example. Can you use four or five cones and a football? Do you really need anything else at the moment? If they're going to start using bibs, then that player should keep that bib for the duration of the session, shouldn't be handed over to another player and should obviously be washed straight after. So again, not preaching, but just some considerations. Um, and then we've already mentioned that stuff around physical and mental well-being, but ensuring that your sessions support the players with regards to those areas as well. Linking to the physical stuff, there's no reason whether you're working 1v1, whether you're working in your small groups, there's absolutely no reason why your players can't be physically active throughout your session. So at the end of your one hour slot that you might have with your players, the players know that they've had to physically um, exert themselves within reason, um, but they've been fully engaged both physically, technically and psych and socially as well. So they know at the end of the session they've got maximum returns from that. Um, linking to some stuff, two kind of points, LinkedIn, stuff around personal best. So you might, with your players, you might ask them to have a go at something, whatever that may be. So it might be um, you're working within a channel. Um, how quickly can you get from one end of the channel to the next? Or how many touches on the ball can you get? And then they might have another go to try and beat their score and another go and another go to try and work towards their personal best. But then if you can... If you're not working in a 1v1 environment, so you're working in small groups of two, three, four, or potentially five, can you try and get them competing against one another? So can you include some competition about you're in your own areas, but who can do the most of this or who can get here the quickest? So try and bring in that competition to increase connection and motivation and enjoyment. Celebrate success like you always would do, um, but place a real emphasis on that. So celebrating the success of your players individually and collectively, and then final point on this slide, massive, just make sure your players are having fun, okay? Staying safe, but having as much fun as possible when they come to your session, because if they're not having fun, whether it's now or moving forwards, what's the point, okay? Um, just the last couple of slides, a um, few things that you've probably already covered tonight, but stuff around challenging and supporting your players. Graham has already mentioned the steps principle, which you can still bring in to support. Um, individual players now. So what's the size area that they're working within? If you're trying to get them traveling over a distance and they've got limited time, do you make the area bigger or smaller for certain players? So you might have five seconds to get from A to B, but for one player, it's shorter than it is for the other player. Already mentioned the stuff around personal best um, and linking that to personal challenges from you as coaches that you can offer players and giving different challenges for different players based on their age, ability, etc. And then stuff around scaffolding learning, um, so linking that to challenge levels, where do you start with your players? So if you bring your players in, and again, this is now, but this is also moving forwards, what's your start point? Because what we often do as coaches is we start, I don't know if you can see my hands, but we often start here. We start at point A and we want to get to point B, but actually we might start a little bit closer to point B. And if the players are struggling a little bit, we might drop it down a little bit. But what we might find is if we start too low before we start scaffolding, that first 5, 10, 15 minutes might be not wasted time as such, but it might not be real value time. So what's your start point with your players and how can you then look to start scaffolding and increasing the challenge level? Um, final point, I already mentioned it, but can you try and get as much competition in as possible? So would your players prefer to come and do a one-on-one uh, -on -one session with you as a coach? Or would they prefer to come along in those smaller groups where it's maybe me and a mate and you as the coach? or four of us in a group. Obviously, lots of benefits around the 1v1 stuff, so I'm not criticising that. Lots and lots of benefits, but just stuff around if you've got smaller groups, you might get that little bit extra competition added in, which might increase the engagement and motivation of players. Um, linking to that, you could form what I'm calling here a mini team. By a team, I don't mean playing as part of a team, but it might be if you've got four players you might say that player A and B are going to combine their scores on an individual basis and then put them together to see if they've managed to beat player C and D. So you're trying to put players still working on their own individually in their own areas, but forming those scores as part of a collective team 
to then have them collaborating with one another and competing against other players and again will increase the connection between players and will increase the competition. And um, Graham mentioned the use of time earlier about how long you've got, but also using your time to give challenges. So we've already mentioned it, but how quickly can you get from A to B? How quickly can you be against your mates or little timed race? And again, mentioned the stuff around um, the steps principle. Can you make an area bigger or smaller for players to increase the challenge further? Um, stuff again around, and it links to the skills corridor one that Graham mentioned earlier that I'm going to show you now, but stuff around um, technical execution, so touches on the ball. So can you get from A to B having had the most touches on the ball possible, or can you get there having had 20 or more? Or if you're doing something on running with the ball, can you get from A to B having had no more than three or four touches? Linking in with that is obviously stuff around um, creativity, um, encouraging them to try skills, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And then if you've done courses and coach Ed with the FA over recent years, you'll know that the stuff around language is really important. So asking players to try to rather than can to, because if you're asking them, can you do this? The players might say, no, I can't. But if you're asking players, try to, the players might go and have a go. They might be able to do it. They might not, but they'll try and engage with what you've asked them to do. And then final little bit before the lads might chip in. You might not be able to see that, appreciate that you might not be able to because of the amount of information that's on there, um, but I'll send this over to you so you've got that. I might even put it on social media tonight, so if you've got training this weekend, you might want to use it. But just an example session, um, Graham mentioned the skills corridor earlier, which is um, a key arrival activity that we put on the level one, which is very much about a group of players within a tight area working up and down, working on different movement skills and working on the technical execution of the ball with lots of traffic um, and interference, but not too much real applied pressure. Now, all I've done is stripped that back and gone with the skills corridor, but where players are working within their own areas. So if you'll see the red player on the top, they've got their own channel to work within. The width and depth of that is up to you as a coach based on your players but then you believe in an additional channel at the side spare so that then you've got the social distance in place for player blue and then a gap again and then the red player again. So the players can still be getting up and down the channel, working on whatever it is you're working on. So it might be changes of speed or changes of direction if you're working on the FMS stuff or if you're working on the technical execution of the players, you might be looking at the way they can shift the ball, change direction, manipulate the ball in different ways different skills, different touches on the ball, and then maybe starting to compete with each other. So how many times can you get up and down that corridor, performing a turn at the end, maybe executing a little skill in the middle, but you've got three minutes to see how many times you can get up and down. And then player red is playing against player blue, is playing against player red as well. So just a bit of an example of something that should be, if set up appropriately, um, using limited equipment, players having their own ball in their own areas, but still engaging and competing against different people, um, technically, physically, but still having that social and psych interaction as well. Andy, Graham, anything to add? Yeah, we're, we're, there's a couple of questions we are really tight for time, but I think it's important that we ask them. Um, yeah. One came in from Billy, if I can quickly find it. Um, how do we as coaches answer the question, um, are we playing a game yet? They will ask it. In terms of currently? Yeah. Um, I think it probably just, Billy, comes down to the, the education and support mechanism that you put in place. And I think that comes down to you engaging with the parents initially um, in terms of phone calls or WhatsApp groups before your players arrive to training. Because let's not lose sight of things at the moment. There's some parents that don't feel comfortable with their kids returning to school. So rightly or wrongly, depends on what bus you're on. But if you don't want your kids going back to school, there's a fair chance they don't want their kids returning to football at the moment. Again, everybody's a different mindset at the moment. So I think really important that if you are going to return to training, that you engage with the parents beforehand. You let them know what protocols are going to be in place, what kind of stuff you're going to be doing with your players and how you're going to help and support them across those four corners but making it really clear before players arrive, this is what we're going to be working on. This is what it looks like. It might be a little bit different to normal. There might not be any games at the moment, but at the moment, this is the best we can do. And if we don't follow those rules as coaches, as parents, as players, then all we're going to do is we're going to start putting things further and further back in terms of that real return to football. So if we can engage with more practices like this at the moment, 
the sooner that real football will return. And again, as we've highlighted at the start, that might come back sooner rather than later. But we don't have that guidance in place yet and we don't know what it's going to look like. Andy, there's, anything else? There's a question here from Wes. Um, it's around, does the guidance around COVID allow for heading the ball? Now, from my understanding, the, the guidance here is to use hands as little as possible. So therefore, I think the head is going to be uh, one of the last body parts you want to be using with the ball. Yeah, I would. my answer would be I don't know. Um, my answer to you would be don't do it. Simple as that. And if you consider all the other guidance at the moment around heading the ball anyway, and how we're not doing heading practices for certain age groups, um, probably shouldn't be doing that stuff regardless. Um, focus more on the technical execution with the ball at the feet. But I would, yeah, I would very much stay clear of any sort of heading, any sort of stuff where players are touching the ball with their hands. Any more, Andy? Uh, let me have a... There's a one from um, Gary. Initially, uh, I think the kids will be happy and have some football training and parents. Uh, there may be a danger of overthinking our first uh, lot of sessions, as mentioned previously. Now, I agree with this. And it goes back to the point you've just mentioned there, Rich, is obviously new guidance will be released in due course based on what the government have released. What I would advise is, let's just aim the side of caution. Let's just digest the information, not rush into it. The last lot of guidance, I'm sure within hours of it being released and certainly within a day of it being released, groups are out on the grass. I don't think that's enough time to digest the information and put realistic measures in place to, to safeguard everybody. But let's just be sensible because like you say, Shuffs, it's the big picture. If we get a second wave, we're going to be in a worse position and I think we just need to be cautious of that. Yeah, and I think it's just worth kind of reaffirming what we said earlier. We're as eager and as keen as people who work in football full time for football to return. Um, we want to be back on the grass as soon as possible, working with players and working with coaches. But it's just got to be done in the right way. So all we can do as a county FA and all you guys can do as coaches is wait for the information to come out from the FA. Um, as Andy says, digest that information and then start looking at the plans that you can put in place to return following the guidelines um, as safely and as appropriately as possible through, li um, through liaison with your parents, your club, your committee, etc. Um, but yeah, as I say, all very excited for it to return, but just needs to be done properly as and when. So keep your eye on the FA website, keep your eye on D Durham FA's Twitter feed, website, etc. And the information will hopefully be with us sooner rather than later, but it might not necessarily be this weekend. Andy, any more? No, that's all. Guys, just to um, finish up then, just from myself, firstly, just a massive thanks to Graham. Um, myself and Andy work for Durham FA full time and are both tutors as well. Um, so this is kind of part of our working role being here now. Graham's a tutor and he stepped up to deliver now, uh, tonight um, voluntary um, in his own time. It's not just been the hour and a half that he's invested today. We've had a a meeting earlier on with Graham. Um, we had a meeting yesterday for an hour to go through this. He's been planning it for a couple of weeks. So massive thanks to Graham. Um, hopefully you've got lots from Graham um, and a little bit of the input that me and Andy have thrown in as well. What we're really keen to happen now is this. Um, if you're on social media, that is the official Twitter account for the Coach Development Programme, um, the one that's highlighted in yellow. And then obviously my email address is there at the moment as well. Any feedback you've got, please fire it over to us either via social media or via um, my email address or any questions you've got same thing fire over but we're really keen to help and support as best we can so if you believe following tonight that there's something that you want and um, graham myself andy or any other guys that we've got lined up to dig into in any more detail let us know and we'll do so and um, we've obviously got a whole host of people lined up to come and deliver and present over the course of the season um, equally, we'll, we'll obviously react to the stuff that you guys want. So if there is anything, let us know. Um, and if there's real interest in a certain area, it's something that we'll obviously look to deliver as well. Very keen as well, I suppose, linked to the return to football. We're very keen as a county FA to get back to some face-to-face -face delivery. Um, but again, at the moment, that's not possible. So we'll continue with these webinars, probably on a fortnightly basis. Um, and in terms of the evening that we look to pick, it'll be based on what football's on that night. Um, so we'll try and keep away from the Premier League evenings because we know key, uh, people are keen to watch that. Um, so, yeah, so hopefully not next week, maybe the week after, there'll be something else that we'll be throwing in your direction. But, yeah, thank you very much for your time. 
feedback, questions over on Twitter or via email to me, please. Just and before, or Graham. Yeah, just before you go, um, can we thank everyone who's contributed tonight on the chat because it's the first time we've done it. Um, there's been some really good questions on there and also interaction with each other. Um, and that's what we want to try and develop going forward. So the more we can bring into that, the more useful it's going to be. So just a big thank you from us for that as well, because it has been our first time. So no doubt we've missed a few, um, but we will try and answer them on the, the email that we send out as well. So thanks very much. Graham, any last words of wisdom? No, just thanks very much. When we talk about the ugly zone, I've been in the ugly zone tonight. <laughs> yeah. It has it has been a it has been a challenge, guys. We've spoke about this all day today. It's, this is as much as we've done a couple of launches, which myself and Graham and Andy to an extent weren't on. Um, this is the first time, pretty much, that we've gone down this route with the webinars. Um, so yeah, different challenge, interesting, hard because you can't interact properly with you guys. But hopefully, you found it worthwhile and beneficial. Um, thanks for your time. Keep safe, keep well, and good luck when you do decide to return to football. And hopefully we'll see you all again very, very soon. Go and enjoy your Friday evenings. Log out. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.